Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ranjani Ganapati. I'm a fifth year medical student from Charles University in Prague. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bernard, Dr. Stein, Dr. Naka, the whole AMIQD team, and George Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss oxoclonus myoclonus syndrome. So, just to give a brief overview, I'll first start by describing a patient who presented with this syndrome in uh, my hospital that I've seen earlier. And then touch briefly upon the pathogenesis of the disease, the etiology in adults and children, uh, the algorithm for evaluation when we suspect the syndrome, uh, the concept of cerebellar reserve and why it's important to start treatment as soon as possible, the prognosis, the therapy, the follow-up, and finally, a few points to conclude. And I hope this will be an interesting topic because this occurs not only in the adult, but also the pediatric neurological population. And since we have some pediatric neuro neurologists listening today, I hope it will be of interest to them also. So to start, uh, the patient was a 30 year old man who was on a ship for a business trip and he had some seafood and after his return, he felt a bit unwell. He had some headache, vomiting, anorexia and at first he just, and some joint pain. And at first he just brushed it aside thinking it's, it's probably just the flu. And then after two days, he started having neurological symptoms. So it was gait instability, uh, muscle weakness in his legs, and he couldn't walk without any assistance. And he also found it, found it quite unpleasant to keep his eyes open. So he, when he visited us, he, had his, he, he spoke with his eyes closed. So um, first he was sent to emergency and admitted in the neuro ICO and ICU, and they were unsuccessful in making the diagnosis after which he was transferred to our hospital. And I'll, give, I'll show you a video of a patient who's presented similarly to the one I saw. This is not the one that I saw, but it's an interesting video. So in terms of his past medical history, he had no other comorbidities. He didn't have any hypertension, diabetes. Uh, he was otherwise very healthy and he wasn't on any chronic medication. He was a non-smoker and he hadn't ever tried any drugs and he rarely drank alcohol. Um, in terms of his occupation, he worked with some animals, but he never came in contact with any chemicals or antibiotics or any toxins. The only notable point is that he was going through a divorce, so he was under some severe psychological stress. So on the video that we saw, there were some objective findings, like for example, the, the positive finger nose test and there was intention tremor and this died of uh, Also, Also uh, here we couldn't hear him speak, but in the patient that I saw, there was some mild cerebellar dysarthria and like his uh, phonation was shaking a bit and he had the scanning speech and the obstaclonus. So this is the reason why I said it was very unpleasant for him to keep his eyes open because it's 
uncontrolled spontaneous chaotic non-rhythmic eye movements that you saw that where it was like moving in all planes and all directions and this is why he found it really difficult to read and and this also affected his stability uh, then we also saw some myoclonic jerks in the ax axial and orofacial muscles and this is a bit less so in the distal extremities and that, uh, and this can be like paleocerebellar syndrome because it was more truncate ataxia and he found it really hard to stand and there were a lot of gait disturbances not only because of the truncate ataxia but also because of the decreased visual input due to the opsoclonus so uh, even though we knew what it was we had to do some examination and imaging so it started with ct to rule out something acute and it was normal the spinal and brain mri were also normal on neurophysiology testing, the EEG was abnormal. The visual evoked potentials and somatosensory evoked potentials were abnormal. But um, yeah, and finally, on the CSF examination, in the first lumbar tap, uh, we could see a few oligoclonal bands and uh, increased albumin quotient due to dysfunction of the blood brain barrier. But it's very important to repeat these findings because sometimes CSF findings evolve. So if something's inconclusive in the beginning, it helps to redo them because over time, uh, these results do change. So we can actually, the oligoclonal bands are a bit more obvious towards the end, there are six. And there's also, they're also restrict to, restricted to the CSF. So we can, we know that it's inflammation in the central nervous system. And other examination, we did the basic panel of all blood tests and checked for autoimmune diseases. All of these were negative. Then microbiology, PCR test to see if it was uh, something viral or bacterial or if it was some zoonotic agent or parasites. All of this was normal. Uh, on neural psychological tests, there was mild cognitive deficit, like a bit of decreased psychomotor vigilance and decreased analytic and visual constructive abilities. And finally, the most important examination is actually a whole body PET scan, which was normal. Um, the urology and ENT exam, lung CT, chest ultrasound, all of these were normal. All that we found were some oncomarkers in the blood, which is quite helpful. There was slightly increased uh, oncomarkers for small cell lung carcinoma and for uh, gastrointestinal one. But otherwise, it was normal. And uh, anti-HU, anti-RI, anti-YO, anti-myelin, anti-amplifizin, all of these on repeated testing were negative. And the, the important point is that finding nothing on, on the PET scan doesn't mean that we can rule out uh, something paraneoplastic because many times uh, obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome presents up to three years before uh, the, uh, not only the symptomatology of the cancer, but also it being visible on a PET scan. So we finally came to the diagnosis of obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome. And in that obstaclonus was the ocular motility with spontaneous arrhythmic uh, conjugate saccades in all directions of gaze. So this should not be confused with nystagmus or ocular flutter. And myoclonus was uh, brief shock-like involuntary movements uh, with muscular contractions or inhibitions. So that the, the, the the difficulty in this disease is not in establishing the diagnosis, but the etiology, because it's, uh, like I said, if it, it's broadly can be characterized as something paraneoplastic or idiopathic, which is usually post-infectious, but pointing out the etiology is different. And also the etiology is usually different in adults and in children. So when we see patients with some strange neurological symptoms, we should always suspect something paraneoplastic. Uh, the mechanism of the disease is a bit unclear. Uh, also, because it's so rare, it's hard to study it on a large cohort of patients. Uh, it's generally thought to be a dysfunction in the brainstem and cerebellar pathways. So the first theory is that it's due to damage of the omnipose cells in the mesencephalon, which normally prevent these unwanted saccades, which is the opsoclonus. So since they are not inhibiting it anymore, we can see the activity of these burst neurons. The second one, which is uh, thought to be a bit better, is disinhibition of the fastigial nucleus in the cerebellum. And the third one is that it could just be some unknown autoimmune hype, uh, etiology because many patients do respond to immunosuppressive therapy. So that, that does indicate that it could be something autoimmune. Now the etiology in adults um, is usually due to something paraneoplastic, usually neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, 
It could be due to encephalitis, which is either due to something autoimmune, viral, post infectious, or exposure to some toxins or drugs. Or if we cannot identify the cause, we can say it's idiopathic. In children, almost 50% of the time it's due to neuroblastoma. And this is really important to note because if we see a child with, with uh, osteoclonus, myoclonus, there has to be thorough investigation to exclude neuroblastoma. And the other 50% is due to these other uh, causes which are less frequent, like lesions in the pons, mesencephalon or thalamus, sarcoidosis, hydrocephalus, hyperosmolar coma, or celiac disease. So this is the algorithm for evaluating a patient when we suspect oxoclonus myoclonus syndrome. So firstly, we need to see whether it really is oxoclonus. So are the, are, do we see these random continuous large amplitude saccades? And if we do see it, then we move to the next step, which is to check whether at least three or four of these criteria are fulfilled. Whether we see oxoclonus, myoclonus, ataxia, and behavioral changes. So if we see at least three of this, then finally we know what we have. And then the, the task is to find out the etiology. So you do MRI, EEG, and CSF uh, checks to see if we find something on there. And if not, we finally start um, investigations for something that could be pyroneoplastic, like a PET scan. So every child with oxyclonus myoclonus should be screened for occult neuroblastoma with a contrast enhanced CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. In addition, we should also check for urine catecholamine measurements. And there's also this MIBG test, which is very sensitive and specific, not only for detect detecting the cancer, but in detecting neuroblastoma, but also post-therapeutically as follow-up to see if it's recurred or we find something once again, and also for detection of metastasis to the bone. So a failure to find neuroblastoma does not exclude the possibility that there is one because there's no investigation with 100% sensitivity. And if the workup is negative, the, all these investigations should be repeated perhaps after three months, just to make sure that this, this is not the cause. And in adults, uh, similarly, again, a contrast enhanced CT of uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, uh, uh, and a careful breast and pelvic examination, mammography, all of these should be done. And if no malignancy is revealed, then we can check for onconeural antibodies, especially anti-RI and HU. And once again, negative antibody testing does not rule out a pyroneoplastic etiology. It does favor a suspicion of it, uh, but it does not rule out anything. And if, if a patient is just in a high risk age group, for example, maybe about 60 years or a smoker, or if they have not been responsive to IVIG or steroids, then we should definitely um, evaluate a bit more. Then this is a, a, a very simple thing that we all know, this, uh, the, diet, the concept of cerebellar reserve. So there is a, and this explains why it's important to start uh, treatment uh, vigorously as soon as possible, because there's a point until which we can restore the cerebellum and its functionality. And this is the sweet spot. And after that, it's, uh, it's already a bit too late. And this is a huge table, but all I'm trying to get, get to is that of all the progressive cerebellar ataxias, oxoclonus myoclonus syndrome accounts for just 0.8% of them. It's extremely rare, but it's hard to confuse because this sign, this manifestation of oxoclonus is only seen in it. So even if there's other forms of ataxia and myoclonus, if we see this, we should, shouldn't be confused with anything else. And then finally, moving on to therapy, because it's such a rare disorder, there's no strict guidelines for how it should be uh, treated symptomatically or for just the eradication of the disease. It's similar to all other autoimmune diseases where you first start with high dose steroids, and if they're unresponsive to that, we move on to plasma paresis and IVAG and some symptom symptomatological treatment. So for our patient, the one that I saw, we started with five grams solimodrol, which is methyl prednisolone for a whole week, over a week, which is one gram per day. But there was still worsening of symptoms, which meant that he was unresponsive. And then finally, clonazepam for decreasing the myoclonia. This was just symptom symptomatic, but this didn't help much either. So we started plasma phases over a long period of time. And then finally, the symptoms began to improve. And then IVIG, uh, uh, sorted out the rest of the problem. So after this, there was a significant improvement. And then once again, I'll show you the rest of the video.
which is not my patient, but this is ideally how everything will be solved. This is the best case scenario, but usually there are some residual uh, symptoms that are still left behind, just a bit of oxoclonus, for example. So once again, uh, we can't just rush to treatment. If, there's, if, it's some, if we find something perineoplastic, the neoplasm should be removed first and then followed by a combination of different immunotherapies. So as a general rule of thumb, ACTH and steroids usually work better in children uh, independent of etiology. So whether it's because of neuroblastoma or something else or some structural lesion, uh, this works better for children. IVIG and plasmapheresis uh, don't help so much. And, they, and even in adults, they help a lot better in the idiopathic uh, oxoclonus myoclonus. So if it's something post-infectious or something that's not perineoplastic, IVIG and plasmapheresis usually help in showing some improvement. And that's also why the idiopathic form of OMS has a better prognosis. And along with this, there are a few studies on other immuno immunomodulating therapies like azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, and mycophenolate. But this is not the first line treatment. And we can also do some symptomatic control of the eye movements with propranolone and clonazepam. So Finally, the follow-up steps. So in our patient, we weren't able to point out the etiology. So in such a person, we have to do regular clinical follow-ups and long-term treatment until we try. We really do help in resolving the symptomatology. So regular IVIG, repeated uh, screening, repeated CSF exams, repeated neuropsychological exams, and repeated MRI. And finally, to conclude, um, the perineoplastic syndrome that uh, uh, etiology of oxoclonus myoclonus syndrome can perceive the symptoms of the malignancy by up to three years. So if symptoms resolve, we shouldn't just uh, uh, brush it aside, but still continue follow-up. And ne again, negativity of uh, immunoglobulins is often found, and this does not mean that there is no uh, neoplasm underlying. There is a positive effect of steroids, HCPH, IVIG, and plasmapheresis. Spontaneous remiss remission isn't common, but when it is, it's usually when it's, um, it's idiopathic and not perineoplastic. Relapses are frequent, and, some, and even in spite of treatment, sometimes there are res residual neurological deficits. And this is an interesting disease to understand because it uh, shares some parallels with other autoimmune neurological disorders like MS, NMO, stiff person syndrome, etc. So these are my references. And thank you all for your attention. Feel free to ask me any questions.